Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning into our service on our YouTube channel. We are in our Nehemiah series where our pastor's heart is really to just talk about how we fortify our lives in the Lord so the enemy can't get in and steal and kill and destroy and how we build that up with God in every way in our lives. So let's get into the service. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you at the end. She's awesome. She is awesome. <laughs> And you get to see a little bit of her sense of humor, like with the foundation thing. She is like that all of the time. So um, welcome. So glad that you're here. There are not the normal notes uh, this weekend like we would do online, uh, at least with the fill in the blanks, right? It's going to be just a little bit different. Um, when I was a kid growing up, and maybe you will remember this if you, uh, if you grew up in the 70s and the 80s and... Um, watched any TV, whenever they would uh, change a program, it read something like this. We interrupt this regularly scheduled program <laughs> in order to bring you the following special, right? You remember those, those words, right? So that was sort of the idea with this. We're not done with our series um, on Nehemiah yet, but I felt like there were some things that the Lord had, they, they were just like now things that he spoke to me about what's going on in space and time a little bit with the building that we're purchasing, just some things that I felt like, um, I, I, like the Lord gave them to me, but I knew that I was supposed to share them with us because it's not, it's, it wasn't just for me, it was for us, right? So that's what I want to, um, what I want to do this weekend. And uh, I, I don't really have a name for it. Other, I just wrote this down, three things the Lord showed me. How's that right there? So <laughs> I'm not great. They change my titles all of the time. And uh, yeah, so um, that's, that's where I wanted to go. I did want to share with you, uh, I've received a lot of really sweet uh, letters and stories as people have been a part of what we're doing with Legacy as we look towards the future and looking at the buildings. And I want to share over the next few weeks uh, some of those letters. They're that special. They're that, um, they're, they're that type of treasure. They're really worth sharing with you. This is one, it's, it's really quick, it's a little condensed. The people that, um, when I share them, I always ask permission to share, and most of them always say, it's great to share the story, but please keep us anonymous. We don't want, sometimes they're sharing things maybe about their family, right? And they don't want that to be publicized, or maybe they're sharing something that, um, maybe if, if you knew they might be embarrassed, that type of thing, or maybe it's just with their giving, they don't want you know, it's kind of like what the Bible says, don't let the right hand know what the left is doing and just do it in front of God. So this is a story that we condensed. It's from a person who goes to our church and um, it just reads this way. Uh, he says, I have one more point. He had sent me just a story on being involved in, in legacy. I said, I have one more point on how the Lord works in all circumstances. I had mentioned in a previous email to you that my mother was raised a non-believer uh, and you kindly set my heart at peace when you advised me on whether she would go to heaven or not. So the question was, what would happen to her? And of course, I, you know, this, I, it's a longer question than just a sentence right there. But I just showed him a couple of scriptures. And ultimately, what I told him is, it's not his responsibility to judge what happens to his mother. It's God's responsibility. His responsibility is to pray and to trust God. And I just shared some scriptures that give hope. When you have non-believers in your household, the Bible actually teaches that um, for, for those of faith... God works in a way of grace with non-believers in our family. And it's not to say that they don't need to make a decision for Jesus, but it is to say that it's not our responsibility. And God has his way. Just trust me on that. He is merciful and he has his way. So I shared some scriptures with him. And then this is what he, uh, he said to me. You gave me 1 Corinthians 7, 14 and Acts 16, 3. And I was telling her about JFC's legacy project and she could see how important Jubilee is to me. So this is what he said. She determined that she wanted to give a donation also uh, to the Legacy Project, even though she's not a believer and obviously doesn't attend our church. So she gave $7,000 to be a part of our Legacy. <laughs> and I just, it's what a special, special thing. And I, I commended just that faith. I commended that heart. I commended that level of commitment to, to a mom, right? I love that. I, I believe in that personally, and I commend that to him. So I, I just wanted to share that 
uh, to you. Yep. So um, three things that the Lord had showed me just about this space and time, this building legacy uh, that I want to say right now. Maybe you've heard me say this in the last year. Um, the difference between prophecy and history is when it's said, right? Now, that doesn't mean everything of history is prophecy. That's not at all what that means. But it does mean that oftentimes when God is moving, one of the required elements that, that make it powerful is our faith. We need to say out loud, what we believe that God is doing. Now, of course, you're always risking a little bit when you do that. Is it presumption? Did you actually hear from God? All of those things are true. All of those things need to be considered. But I will just say this. When you believe it's God, you have a responsibility to be bold with what yeah. you believe is God. You need to stand on that thing. It activates something in your life. And I think that faith comes by hearing so that when we say those things out loud, other people also can grab onto it, right? So this is not a project for me or for Chris or for our staff. It's a project for us, for our church. We're going to reap the benefit of this. We're going to eat the good fruit. We're going to see God do powerful things, not only in our community, but in our lives. So I, that's what this is. It's me wanting to say ahead of time what I, I hear God saying to me, what I see uh, in my head, in my heart, God is showing me. I, I want to say it out loud, even though you might go, well, that's pastor. We believe that. To, I mean, you know, that's not even in question. The, the difference between history and prophecy is right now when you say it, right? And I just think that there would be some people that could grab onto this this weekend and it could be powerful in their life. For instance, how about healing, right? I, the last two weeks, I have been extremely sick. Chris and I debated going to the hospital. It's been that, that bad. I sent uh, uh, just a prayer request to my staff yesterday and just said, please be praying for me right now. I, I, I need to minister this weekend. It's such an, a critical time. I've got some other ministry opportunities that, that I've said yes to that I need to be prepared for. And I'm, I'm just, I was in this really, really bad place. Went to sleep last night after giving that to the staff. I woke up this morning and God had healed me. Let's look, man. I'm healed. Not, not, like, not, not like, hey, you got a good rest and, and everything's a little bit better. It wasn't like that. It was serious. And it was for Chris and I to be talking about, hey, we might need to go to the hospital for it. Um, it's, it's that level. So I, when you say things like that, what I'm hoping for is not for people to go, wow, look at Pastor John. What I'm hoping is that you'll hear faith in those statements. And then if you're sitting here and you feel like, I, I, I need God to do that for me or for someone that I love or someone that I'm praying for. When you hear, God is not a respecter of persons. God does not play favorites. He does not show to one what he doesn't show to another. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He, he's always merciful, always faithful, always on our side. Listen to me. God is a healer and will heal you too. You can believe that and you can ask for that. So um, here, here's where we, where we are. The first one that I want to talk about, uh, you can turn right or you can turn left. That's not a political statement, by the way, right? <laughs> don't, uh, don't read into that right there. It is just simply something that God is showing me right now. Genesis 28, 15. Look at this sweet verse right here. So the patriarchs of our faith are Abraham, Isaac, and who? Jacob. And Jacob. So this is a story about Jacob. Jacob is wrestling with God. He has a dream, and in that dream... Um, the Lord shows him all sorts of things that have to do with the covenant that he gave to his father and his grandfather. And then he has this wrestling match with God. It's, it's a powerful, powerful story. And, um, and this is the outcome of it. What's more, this is God talking. I am with you and I will protect you wherever you go. I am with you and I will protect you. Where, so if you turn left or you turn right, I'm going to be with you. If you're like me, and you love God, probably one of your considerations is that you're always asking, God, I don't want to miss you. God, what I do in my life, I want to be obedient. I want to follow hard after you. God, I, sometimes I even pray this, God, don't let me go my own way. Stop me from doing something that's not what you want. And here's what I really believe, that if you're trying to follow God, God is merciful and won't let you miss him. He will not let you miss him. If you are trying, he will make sure that you follow him, that you find him. We plan our ways. God orders our steps. It has been really a concerning issue for me throughout the years that as I'm leading, I'm always asking God, is that the way you want me to go? God, I don't want to miss you. I don't want to mislead our church. I don't want to do the wrong thing. I want to do the right thing. And God has always been so faithful to tell me, John, I'm with you. Now, it is important that we know where we're supposed to be going and what we're supposed to be doing. We don't just like wake up, flip a coin, and God will bless it, right? But when we really are searching and we're not sure, I believe that God will direct us. He'll make sure. 
So which building has been really important to me? I have been a little tied up in that. I have spoken out loud that the CU building is the one that I want, but I also have said out loud that I'm not sure that that's what's going to happen. It depends on how much money we can raise. It depends on whether or not we can get together with CU. And if not, I've said out loud the whole time, I can turn and go to the other building in a, in a moment. I will mourn privately for a moment. <laughs> right? But I will be okay and I will lead well. You'll never even know that I was mourning. That's the truth of the matter. I'm not a powder. I won't stand up here and pout in front of you. I will do exactly what the needful thing is. But my heart has been, God, I don't want to miss you. So God, show me if I'm making a mistake, if this is any ego, if this is any just flesh, if it's just excitement, God, and I'm making a mistake financially or I'm making a mistake with, with something that you don't want, God, protect the church from me. Yes. Right? Now, I, I don't think I'm dangerous to the church. But I, you know, you get what I'm, I don't want to make a mistake. Anybody else like, you just, I don't want to make a mistake. So I'm asking God just like, and this is what the Lord told me, John, you can turn left, you can turn right. The bottom line is I'm with you and I will protect you. And that is important, important, important as we're going forward. So when I saw this turn left, turn right again, it's not political. Don't think, okay, which one's left? Cause I'm going to stay away from that one. Uh, oh, come on. I know my audience, come on, come on. Not all of you, but a lot of you, I know. <laughs> so, which, <laughs> so which one, right? Which, so I put Nichols for left, not political. So if we turn left and we go to the Nichols building, I felt like the Lord gave me a picture and I thought I would share with you, what would the church look like? Like I saw two pictures and I felt like the Lord said, you can choose. And I felt like he said this to me. You have been faithful for 23 years. You have been faithful. You have led well. Not perfect. I'm not a perfect man. I'm not a perfect pastor. I never claimed that. But I am legitimate. I am honest. And I do what you see. It's true. It's what, there's no hidden thing that I'm some other person living a double life when I'm not. This is it. And time bears those things out. Time does bear those things out. So I felt like the Lord said, John, it's a reward for you. If you go left, I'm with you. If you go right, I'm with you. You get to choose which one you want. And then I felt like he showed me two pictures of what the church would look like, depending on what the choice was. So the first one, Nichols, if we were to turn left, the Nichols building, here's what I felt like the Lord said, it will be easier. Who's good for easier? You know, past 50, you want easier. Is it true? Yes. Look, before 50, you're not smart enough to know easier. But after 50, you know, easy, and you're like, uh, easier is good. I'll take easier. And there's nothing wrong with easier. And sometimes we think that if it's easier, then God couldn't be blessing that. He couldn't be because God's in the, he's in the go for it thing. I think the reward sometimes for doing the right thing is he makes it easier for us. And I'm a, I like easier. I don't wake up in the morning like, God, make my road hard today. Like, you know, you want, you want, so easier. Was, I felt like the Lord said, if you go that way, it will be easier for you. It will be easier for the church. It will be easier financially. It will be, it will be an easier road. And I felt like he said to me, there's nothing wrong. If you choose that, there's nothing wrong with that. I felt like he said, if you choose that one, I will bless it. I will be with you and I will bless it. I felt like also the picture that I saw of the church was that, um, it, it was in a building and it was limited in a way like this building became limited too. That we would fill it. That it would hit a place where we would look at it and we would say, you know, wow, look what God has done. But I would know in the back of my mind that again, there, there was a glass ceiling on it. There were walls to it. it, it we were limited. So, not that we aren't doing more. And not that in, in this part of my ministry, as I work towards the, this part of my ministry, right? It's okay to think in terms, of, we've paid the hard price to be here. We did the hard work. We planted in rocky soil. When we came here, I remember meeting with a group of pastors and one of them said, hey, I just want to tell you, this land has a blood curse on it. Like, can you imagine somebody like, hey, welcome and there's a blood curse here. Get ready. And he told me this was a church graveyard. Like just like, like this, a blood curse on it. Some Native American, I was going to say Indian, Native American years ago, put a blood curse on it. And so the churches come here and they, they die, they fail. Well, I mean, what faith that produced that day in the group. Like, I can't wait to get out there and sow in this church graveyard with a blood curse on it. And I, I remember the Lord reminded me real quick. You remember how you got here, 
Chris and I, when we left Northern Colorado to come here, we were really concerned with where we, same question, God, we don't want to miss you. We'll go wherever you want us to go. Just tell us where to go. We don't, we don't want to miss you. And I remember that I would get in my car and I used the, like the, the Moses theory, go spy out the land, right? So we just get in a car and we drive and we try to figure out where's God, where's God? And this scripture, God gave me this scripture. Maybe this is helpful to you. This is Genesis chapter two, verse five. It's, it's early, early uh, in creation. God hasn't released the man and the woman into the garden yet. And this is what it says. No shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up. Listen, for the Lord God had not yet sent rain on the earth because there was no person there to work or till the ground. And this is what the Lord told me. If you're looking for where it's raining to decide if that's where you need to go, it never works that way. I don't waste the rain. I don't waste the resource. I don't waste the good thing. I don't waste the grace. I don't waste the Holy Spirit. You go and I will meet you if you believe that's what you're supposed to do. I will meet you there in space and time and I will bless you. That, look, that is a difficult thing for us because sometimes we step out and we're like, God, where were you? And there is the possibility of maybe we didn't hear. But for some people that freezes them then from moving. We can't ever be in that position. By faith, we serve God. By faith, we step out. By faith, man, we take the, the kingdoms and stand up for God, right? By faith. And so I remember the Lord just telling me, you cannot look around to decide where's the most profitable place in order to go plant the church. You pick the place and step out in faith and I'll meet you there with the resource. And I'm just gonna tell you, every time God met us, every time, with the resource. Every time we needed something, he was there. And in this situation, I felt like that's what he's saying again. If you're looking for what building to decide where it's going to be most blessed, I don't work that. Wherever you go, it's going to be most blessed. That's not in my notes, but I think that's for someone. Wherever you are, that's where it's going to be most blessed. Because where you are, that's where God is going to be at. Remember years and years ago, remember those little bracelets, WWJD? What would Jesus do? David and I, were, we were on staff uh, together at Resurrection Fellowship. And right when those bracelets came out, and, and David, he said to me, um, he said, all these people wearing these bracelets, what would Jesus do? Jesus will do whatever you're doing. So like if you're negative minded, you're thinking Jesus wouldn't go sin with me, wrong thought. Whatever you're doing in faith, Jesus wants to do with you. So instead of sitting there thinking, what would Jesus do? Whatever you're doing, Jesus is with you. It's a powerful thought about active faith right now in our lives. Can you believe that stuck with me all those years? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Re yes. I'm, it's harder to remember things, but some things I remember like just like, like that. <laughs> so the Nichols building, what it would look like. I felt this was the picture that the Lord showed me. I felt it would be a church of probably 2,000 or 2,500, right? Uh, we actually have been a church that big, bigger than that. But that's when we were doing five campuses and giving away, I gave away half of our church, right? And brought it back down to this much more manageable thing. So you might say, well, pastor, why in the world would you want to go back up if you're saying manageable? Because I would do it way different this time. One of the benefits of doing something is knowing what not to do the next time. Anybody? I would not let it control me. I would not let it uh, decide what we do. And I would, not, <laughs> I would not overcommit in the beginning. I would in the beginning decide, here's how far it can go and then live within that. You understand? I, you don't, I, don't, you know, I don't have time to go there right now, but it would be different. And then I felt with the CU building. <laughs> here's what the Lord said to me. It'll be harder. Gosh, it gets quiet as soon as I say that, right? Like, <laughs> like for some of you, it's already decided. You're like, uh, easier, harder. Hmm. I don't have to pray. I, I understand. <laughs> it would also be blessed because where we are, God will meet us there. I will be with you. I will bless you. I will watch over you. I also felt like the picture that I saw, uh, it, the potential of it. I didn't feel like there would be walls on it. I felt like when I looked at it, I could see way to a horizon and the church didn't go all the way to the horizon. Where in the other ones, I felt like it, it went to the walls. And I felt like the difference between the two was like here. This building has defined us and now confined us. 
And I feel like eventually that's what the nickel, and maybe that's okay. Maybe that's exactly what, if we choose that, it's okay. So the CU building, it's going to be harder. It'll be blessed, greater potential. What it would look like numerically, bigger than 2,500 probably. I don't know in a service, but in the building, because of the training center, it will be a lot bigger. We'll say yes to a lot more ministry opportunities. So then here's the question. How do you know which one to choose? It comes back really. Now at this age, it's much easier for me. Let me, the cloth that I'm cut from. Here's what I know about myself. I've never taken the easy way. There's just something in me that just, I, like I like easy, but it's just not, it's not who I am. If it was who I was, I would have stayed at the church that I was at, in the position I was at, being handed the church as the pastor retired in a much more protected environment without having to risk. But it wasn't, I never even considered, is it easier or harder? God said, go. And it was my delight to go. And the blessing that I've had, you know, we, we, I have never prospered more than my, I didn't make as much money for many, many years when we moved down here, but I prospered more. That's what Chris was trying to say. You can actually make less money and prosper more in life. You can prosper more in health and in peace. We, we bought a house that God did magnificent things. Anybody bought that house before? God just did magnificent things. Yeah, several of us raise our hands right now. It made us, I mean, just like, <laughs> it was the first time in our life we actually bought a house when we came here. We planted a church and bought a house. How does that happen? We could never afford one before. But we came here planting a church and God made it possible for us to buy a house. And we bought it in the year 1998. Can you remember what houses were going for in 98? And they just skyrocketed on us. Gosh, we just prospered more than... We bought the house we're living in now 21 years ago. Can you imagine what that house has done in 21 years? It's made $10,000 in 21 years. It's very exciting. So I'm not trying to talk about just... I'm just trying to say, when you're, when you're just in that place, if you're looking like, what does the paycheck say? That's the wrong way to decide whether or not you're going to go do something for God. Yeah. Hey, look at me real quick. Some of you, that's what's, we're just so tied into bottom line numbers. The wrong way to decide is, can I make this, can two plus two add up to four? Yeah. You've got to throw in the equation of faith and God's ability. Do you believe the miraculous? And yes, he blesses good principles uh, of being a good steward with what you have and living within your means and staying out of it. All of those things are true. And then at the same time, God can just do the miraculous with so little that we offer him. You know, all he wants is just your faithfulness. Something about you saying yes to God makes him happy. Goodness. It's just, it's, it really is a simple good news gospel. It's not that difficult. So it's just the cloth that we're cut from. We, <laughs> I said this accidentally. I got some criticism and some people loved it. When I cross the finish line, I want the guns to be smoking. I want the clips to be empty. I want them to be racked back because the last bullet came out of it. I want the armor to be dirty. I don't mind if my face is a little messy and a little bloody. I want to know that when I went across, I was kicking the devil's butt when I did it, right? That's what I want. That's, I, that's just it. I want to finish well. And, and look, if, if easy is the way that you choose, that doesn't mean you didn't finish well. But for me, for me, when I hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, I want to collapse over the finish line. I'll have all of eternity to recover. All of eternity. <laughs> I want to count, man. I want to count. I want to make a difference. I want, I want to tear down the works of the devil, and I want to build up the kingdom of God. I want to see healing be released in our area. I want to see revival come. I want to see, I want to see the blood curse erased. I want, you know what I want? I want a blood blessing from Jesus over this land right here. I don't want to talk about what some witch did. I want to talk about what Jesus did. I don't want to worry about what the world is doing and who's president. I want to talk about the lion of the tribe of Judah setting over the earth and over the universe and in control of everything. 
And that's where I'm at. Now, maybe that's not you. Maybe you're just like, hey, you're, that's not practical. That's why I'm up here teaching. That would be the reason right there. That's it. Okay, second one right here. Where are we in space and time? Uh, Genesis 47, this is what kicked off this season for us. Uh, in 2018, the very end of 2018, we were in Israel, and uh, we, I, I told this, just let me reteach it real quickly. We, had, we were in Jerusalem. The group had gone down to the Dead Sea that day, and um, uh, Masada and uh, in Gedi, they were, they were seeing a bunch of different things. Chris and I had stayed back in Jerusalem that day. The hotel that we stay in is just right there overlooking uh, the Jaffa Gate in the old city wall. And I had opened the doors that morning. It was a beautiful morning. Opened the doors. And um, we were just sitting there looking at the old city of Jerusalem. It's just one of our favorite places in the world to be. And it's why I invite you to go with us, man. You should experience it once in your life. It's just such a powerful thing to see where Jesus walked. Just to see what, what he, it just is powerful. And so we're sitting there. We were worshiping the Lord. We were just telling God how thankful. There's something about being thankful too that just, it, it tracks the Lord. And we were just telling him how thankful we were and how, how good God is to us. And the Lord spoke this to us. We were, we were just reading through some verses and this verse jumped out at us and the Lord spoke to us. The Holy Spirit made it come alive. Meanwhile, the people of Israel settled in the region of Goshen in Egypt there they acquired proper, property, they were fruitful, and their population grew rapidly. And it was right at the end of 2018, I think it was October, November of 2018, and the Lord gave that to us, and I know he spoke and said, this is the season that you're coming into in the church. This is, this is the jubilee, this was it. And I, I looked at that, and I, I, the Lord was just, I was processing and listening. I'm telling Chris what I felt like the Lord was telling me. I came back to the church in early 2019. I shared this. I just said, I don't know when this is coming, but it's coming, this thing of acquiring property. I don't know where. I don't know when. I don't know how. I'm just, how many of you remember me saying it? This is coming our way. It's coming our way. Just get ready. I don't know when, I don't know what, but it's coming our way. I just believe that the Lord, because the difference between history and prophecy is when you say it. Right. And those of you sitting here, look, God is doing this. God is doing this. And so I, I saw that. I bring it back. I say it to the church. Um, and then uh, Rebecca Murley um, and Sandra Vogt, uh, listen to that message. And they did this very kind thing for me. They took those four points, right? Goshen and um, property and fruitful and multiplication. And they put it on this really cool burlap um, sack and they framed it. And then Chris put it up in a strategic place in our house. And I didn't know this, but she, I, I found it out this week. She said, I put it right there so that you would have to see it when you were coming in and going out, so that when you were in a good mood or when you were in a bad mood, when you were full of faith or when your faith was wrung out of you, you would see those words and you would have to contend for the promise that God gave you. Yes. So here's a picture of what it looks like. Let me just show you real quickly if they can pull that up. Is it behind me? Ah, uh, so uh, it says, yeah, it, it, now this background is not the wall in our, we don't have a, like a massive stone wall inside of our... <laughs> Our house. Uh, the people that are responsible for these things make me look far better than I really am. So this is this is what it looked like. This is hanging right outside of our room, right at the stairs that go down, and so we have to come up and down those stairs right there. So it's just people settle in the land of Goshen, acquire property, become fruitful, population growth. This week I was just I was so sick. The last two weeks I've just been so sick, and I just felt so bad. I was sitting on the couch and I'm having one of those complaint sessions with God. Yeah. Anybody, so I, see, like I'm speaking faith right now, but do, do not misunderstand. I am human too. And when I feel bad, I'm like, God, nothing is good. The whole thing stinks. I, I think I'm going to quit. When I go to the hospital, I'm going to quit everything. And you know, the Lord, he does not strike us with lightning. Um, thank God for that. And so... Um, I was just sitting, I just wasn't feeling good. And I just was like, I just didn't have the energy. And I looked over to the side. <laughs> and the Lord just highlighted it to me again. Just sitting there, just feeling so bad and just not, you know, just, just in one of those places. And I just looked over to the side. And I felt like the Lord said to me, let me show you something you haven't seen with it. 
And I just, what? And he said, this is, um, it's a calendar. It's not simply just a boom, here's the whole thing. It's a calendar in space and time. And so I just want to show you where you are in space and time. So he said, this really neat thing has happened in your church. Think about it. People have really settled in, in this land right here. And this has become a very prosperous place spiritually, hasn't it? It's a very fertile place here. And doesn't speak anything about me or anything about Jay and the worship team or anything about our leaderships. It just speaks that God's presence is in this place. It's what allows people from so many different backgrounds. It's such an eclectic group of people. But the one thing that we agree on is that we're going to love Jesus together. I love that, man. I love it that it's not some, it's not, we don't, we're not, you know, some, some denominational thing that attracts people here. It's just Jesus. It's just we concentrate on Jesus and we make it about Jesus. And I mean, God's just been so good. So he just said, look what I've done for you. I've caused people from all different places to come and settle in this. this. And Goshen, by the way, was a Egypt in Egypt that when uh, Joseph went there, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob had a son named Joseph. Joseph ends up in Egypt in a bad way and God raises him up powerfully in this really honorable way. And when Joseph's family, who betrayed him, comes back into Egypt, Joseph could kill them, but he acts like God and says what the enemy intended for evil, God is gonna do good with. And so Pharaoh then, because Joseph loved his family, Pharaoh said, hey, come on into Egypt during a worldwide famine. So what does it teach us? That during worldwide crises, God can do mighty things with his people. Right? During a worldwide crisis, God is not limited in a worldwide crisis. Daniel, God can move, he can move so big in a worldwide, and sometimes I think he waits for a worldwide crisis because it shows off his power even more so. If you could, if you could say, well, it's just a hot economy, then, then maybe you split why it happened. But when, when everything has just gone to freeze and God moves, there's just no other explanation for it. We have settled in, so, so they're given this region called Goshen, and it's, it's the Nile Delta. It's where the Nile empties out right into the top of Africa, and it is a fertile place, but Goshen was undeveloped. And as soon as God's people met in this area with God, he turned it into the most prosperous place in all of Egypt. And the Egyptians actually became jealous that they gave them that piece of ground right there. And God said, look what I've done for you. In a place where it was a church graveyard. I've made you prosper, man. There is no more. You know, another thing the Lord, can I just talk for a minute? Can we just, another thing the Lord told me, if you'll go first and be a windshield, I'll make it easier for other churches to come behind you. No other non-denominational church had been successful in this place in, in being able to build a building and being able to do something and we went first, and if you look around this area now, the dozens of churches that exist right now, so I, so I'm going to take credit for, no, I better not say that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to say it. I'll just get in trouble. I won't say it. But it's a really cool thought in my head. Um, so, so, just this, so I felt like the Lord said, okay, I've done this for you, and right now you're in this place here, right? Right or left? And as soon as you do that, it's going to become a very fruitful time. So it doesn't just happen all at once. I felt like he said, I just want to show you where are. It was just an encouragement to me. I've made you fruitful. I've settled you in this place. You're very settled. And it's a good place. And the people that come into this land, they're blessed in this land. And now you're acquiring property. And after that takes place, it's going to be a time of open heavens is the only way I can describe it. So let me, let me do you remember that, that prayer of Jabez way back in the day? Was that like this, this? Here's this simple prayer. Listen to this. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel. Oh, that you would bless me, enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me. Keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And then this part is the most remarkable thing. And God granted his request. That's an open heaven. That's just like a time when, despite you, right? God just, boom. And I felt like he said with fruitful, like it's fruitful now. And I think a time is coming to this place, to this city, to your family, to your day. So like, how, pastor, how can you be this bold? <laughs> I cannot bring this fruitfulness. 
I can't do anything about this, but I know the one who can. So I'm bragging about my God. I'm not bragging about me or this church or this area. I'm bragging about my God for just a second. My God is going to bless this place. He is, there's going to be an open heaven here. When I talk about a time, it's going, we have been raised in a time of drought. Listen to me for just a moment. Spiritually speaking, we have been born in a time. You guys listen. We're all in the same boat together. So it doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. We're all in the same boat. We've been born in a generation that has been, it's been a droughtful time. It has not been a flush time spiritually in our land and in our day. When we read about revival, we read about it from a time before us. Yes or no? Yes. And I feel like because we grew up in a, in a drought, we've learned to accommodate a drought. If one or two people get healed every few years in faraway places, we're like, see, God really does something. But we put up with the idea that he never has done it for us. That like when we pray, Man, we pray powerful prayers with faith believing and we see little things tumble and little things fall. But we've never seen where just like the enemy is pushed back and the rush of God comes in. So I think we live in a, in a time where, where the, the, the tide, the, the wave, it came in before us and the wave is back out. And we were born and have lived in this time before the wave came back in in history. But the wave's coming, as sure as it went out, it's coming back in. Yeah. And before this world is done and before things are over and before you write it all off, let me tell you about my God. Let me tell you about my God, man. Let me tell you about my God. He is well able. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is able with, with the motion of his hand to push back evil, to open up the heavens. Look, the earth contains the treasures of God. The great deep can break up and the flood of his spirit can come whenever he wants it to. And you just live in a time where we're not used to it. So when someone says these big bragging things about God, we tend to think, oh, that's, that's really great sounding, but I, I just don't know. What, well, what do you know? You know what you know? You know drought. You know lack and you know dry. And it appears to be normal to you because you've never known anything else. And I'm prophesying to you right now. I'm speaking to you right now. You've not known your children to come back to the God that you love. That's the day we're coming to. You've not known those days. <laughs> that fruitful, it means to be fertile, to be abundant, to be healthy. Amos 9.13 is a close scripture of a fruitful time that God prophesies. The time will come, says the Lord. See, this is, he spoke it before it happened. So this is prophecy. The time will come, says the Lord, when the grain and the grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. Can you imagine a time where everything around you is so fruitful that you can't get it out of the ground fast enough? We live in a day where we can take it out far faster than it can grow, yes or no? That's the day you were born in, you've been raised in, and you live in today. But this prophesies of a day that no human in our generation has experienced. I want that day. Look, I'm preaching for that day. I'm staying here for that day. I'm holding out for that day. I'm working hard for that day right now. I haven't given up. I'm not taking the easy way because I want that day right there. That day right there. That day right there. That's the one. And then the rapid growth one, I don't know what that means. Like, is it multiples of people? I, in my mind, I think it means rapid growth spiritually. So that you're not sitting there listening, but that it's activated in your life. So Joel 2 says, your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. And upon men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, says the Lord. So it's not just some like hierarchy where we watch pastors preach great eloquent things and talk about things that happen in other lands that they visit. It's you will dream. You will speak. You will prophesy. You will lay hands on people. That's where the fun is. That's where the power is. And that's where the joy is in our day right there. 
That's what we're believing for. You want to know what the biggest challenge with doing what we're doing is going to be? I'll tell you, I, God showed this to you. It will be assimilation. So now I will make a political statement because I can't help myself sometimes. <laughs> that one of the problems that we face in our day is that when we were growing up, if you're around my age, we worked hard on assimilating people, not causing them to give up who they were, but making them bring who they were to be a part of who we are. Yes. And that's missing today. Yes. And it's left us so divided as a nation and a people. We can't claim that we're a part of a greater thing. We're more worried about hanging on to that old thing. So listen for just a moment. So when you have rapid growth into something and so many people coming into something, that it can change the culture of something if you're not careful. You can have so many people who don't know the good things of God that they can overwhelm the people who do know the good things of God. And then they can dictate what it's going to feel like and what it's going to be like in our services. And we cannot let that happen. We Look, the people who know their God must carry out great exploits. It's time to be strong and be bold. And show people who don't know the way to worship. And show people who don't know the way to faith. And show people who don't believe the way to God. Now's the time. Do you hear what I'm saying? Or I'm just... Ex- like, I, I feel so excited right now, yeah. but some of you are looking at me like, <laughs> All right, the last one is just uh, the year of Jubilee. Um, if you haven't been here for a long length of time, you've probably never told, heard me tell how we got the name Jubilee. And like, uh, you know, if you plant a church today, or in at least in the last 20 years, one of the things that they tell you to do, you've got to pick a name. Like, like there's, there's been this uh, seeker-sensitive movement within the church that said you've got to do things that are not, uh, not offensive. Like, you know, my whole messages are all offensive, right? Like, I, <laughs> like I, 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 seriously, I, you, I, people are seldom left neutral about me. And that's okay. I know the fish that I'm fishing for, right? They're not neutral fish. I'm looking for, like, I want radical. Yeah, I want live fish. There you go. That's right. I'm not looking for a minnow. Okay, so <laughs> when we picked Jubilee, I, it was right before I left to come here to plant the church, and Chris and I were trying to decide, what are we going to call it? And, you know, like community church is the, that's the hot title, community church, community church, community church, right? So I pick Lone Tree Community Church, pick uh, Highlands Ranch Community Church, right? And so I'm preaching this message out of Leviticus 25 on the year of Jubilee, right before I came here, and God starts showing me all these awesome promises of the year of Jubilee. And then he said, that's what I want to do with you, so call it what you want it to be. And I knew picking Jubilee was going to sound, I know. Like, what kind of church is Jubilee? Like, is that an underwear church? What is that kind of a, a what? A joyous one. And I just, so, and then the Lord, when I was bold enough to be willing to do that and not worrying about like, will we be attractive to people if we pick the wrong name? I wanted to be attractive to God. Listen to what I'm saying for a minute. I wanted God to be comfortable in this church. I wanted God, if he came here, to feel like, ooh, that's my place, man. I like it there. I feel good in that place, right? That doesn't mean like he does not in other churches. But I was just like, I had this picture of like, God would go, Jubilee, that, let's go there. That's good. Where like other people might go, don't go there. God would go, let's, let's go there. There's a thousand community churches. Let's go to Jubilee. That's Jubilee. So these three things like came together in a rushing, like just boom, when I was willing to step out of there. So when I was 15 and God called me, this scripture was what he used to call me. When he came to his village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, this is important. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to Jesus. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this statement is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to people who don't have it. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released. Can you understand why I can say it? It's who I am. It's, this is my identity. 
that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come to earth. This time of the Lord's favor, when, I, when he called me, I got the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me. I didn't understand what it meant that the time of the Lord's favor, but it does says this, Jesus was reading from which book in the Old Testament? Okay, this is where he's reading from. It's Isaiah 61, verses one and two. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed and commissioned me to bring good news to the humble and to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted to proclaim release from confinement and condemnation to the physical and spiritual captives and freedom to prisoners to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. There it is again. So I studied, what does this mean right here? And it goes all the way back to Leviticus 25, the year of Jubilee. In that 50th year, they would proclaim three things. One, you're free. Two, you can go back to your family. You have a family. You have an identity. You have a place. And three, the promises of God are yours. If they've been given up through time, space, if you've sold them, if whatever it was, I give them back in this year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee is the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus is the physical Jubilee that's come to the earth. Jubilee doesn't happen once every 50 years. Now, because of Jesus, Jubilee is here all the time. And if the church would ever get the revelation of who we really are, then we don't need to sit here and wait for some. 50th year for something to happen. Jubilee is here now. Yeah. It is here right now. This is the year of God's favor. This is the time. This is it. So this name, Jubilee, man, the Lord brought this back to me and reminded me, John, the things that I've told you, I'm not done. I haven't even begun to do what I want to do yet. So I'll give you three things that he told me real quick, and that they will be quick. One, it's our destiny. Two, it's our identity. And three, it's your call. You think it's my call, and listen to what I'm saying to you. If you go to this church, if you're a partaker with me, if you eat, if this is your storehouse, if this is your, the place where you come and you're taken care of and you're fed and you, you, are, you grow spiritually here, then you're a partaker of this call with God, with me. This isn't my responsibility. This is our responsibility. So this whole legacy thing, this isn't old Pastor John up here. I asked the question in the very beginning, am I doing this for me or am I doing it for you? Because that answer decides your participation. And if you think I'm doing this for me, what a critical mistake you make in time. And if you could get that I'm doing this for us, that I'm pushing hard, we have a good thing here. I can coast. We're at a great place and have worked hard to get here. And I could say, I'm 57. I had a heart attack. I paid the price. I fought a good fight, right? I'm, 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 I've done well. And I don't feel like that's, dude, I'm too young. I don't know who had a heart attack, but it wasn't this guy. It wasn't this guy. It was somebody else. This is my time. And because of that, it's your time. It's your time. Church, come on, man. This is, hold this thing up. Pray about this thing. Be involved in this with us. Look forward to this. Be bold with this. Look at these scriptures that I've given you. Go back, begin to proclaim, begin to pray out loud, begin to say to God, I want to be a part of that. God, how, what? God, show me. Show me. I'll be bold again. If you've not yet given to this, I think you should. I think you're going to miss something if you don't. I think that. Now, if you think different than that, I'm going to love you anyway. But you're wrong, man. You are wrong. <laughs> And you're going to miss something so good. And when you ask God to bless you and God gives you an opportunity to be a part of something that's being blessed, see it for what it is. See it for what it is. Don't miss this. And if you can't, then you're still welcome here. And if you're like, I want to wait and see what happens, okay. Watch. But I think the blessing is in the participation, to be honest with you. I think there's a different reaping level from people who just sit back and I'll be cautious and people who say, I'm jumping in. 
get in over your head, man. Like, I'm not telling you to do something stupid. Finance. Get in over your head with the Holy Spirit is what I'm saying. Don't take the easy, casual, well, I've never experienced anything. Like, I've never experienced that Amos where the grain and the crop grew faster than they could take it out of the ground. But I'm sure willing to jump into that. Anybody? I mean, like, come on. Do that for us, God. Do it here. Well, that's it. We'll go back to Nehemiah next week and talk more about what and how the Holy Spirit is rebuilding our lives. But I just felt like, you know, in space and time, it's important to say these things right now. It's a significant week. This is the week where CU will vote on the whole thing in front of us. Yeah, this, this Thursday. That's exactly right. Please be praying. And if you're like, I don't know how to pray, pray God's will be done. You know, pray God's will be done. And if you hear what I'm saying, then pray they say yes to us. I think that's all. Hey, thank you so much for watching. We hope that what was said and what you gained from this will help to build your life up in the way that the Lord is leading you specifically for right now in your life. Thank you for watching on our YouTube channel. We hope to see you again, however it works for you next weekend.